Is Tony Khan in the process of losing control over his product? No, is the short answer, but there are certain troubling noises emanating from the backstage area and indeed the TV screen that things have been better. Look, no wrestling booker is great forever. The same is almost universally true of artists and creators in general. Well, unless you're Simon Miller, of course. But the maxim is especially true of pro wrestling, an industry that never takes a break. But when precisely did it all go wrong? With that in mind, I'm Adam Wilborn from What Culture, and these are 10 precise moments wrestling bookers lost their minds. Number 10, Triple H. This is conspiratorial, but isn't it funny how NXT declined in quality when other promotions and movements rose to prominence? Did Triple H chase the elixir of critical acclaim in a bid to thwart these new competitors? Look, the brand itself experienced two debated peaks. The warmth of 2015's feel-good storytelling, or, depending on where you sit, the outrageous work rate that highlighted 2018. Finn Balor's headline matches hovered around the 20-minute mark, but by the time that the likes of Adam Cole, Johnny Gargano, and Tommy Ciampa were anointed as the key members of the main event club, the headline attractions almost doubled in length on average. Not necessarily a bad thing automatically, and those individual matches were great in and of themselves, but Bloody hell, the Toronto 2 Sinister Structure debacle brought this excess into brutal focus. This is where Triple H lost it. Triple H replaced emotion with devices and tropes. The all-important feeling was lost. And by the time NXT made it to TV, people were evidently exhausted by the indulgence. Number 9. Delirious in a cyclical way, Ring of Honor followed the same strange path laid down by the WWF in 2001. They lost their minds when they'd never been bigger. Ring of Honor had grown its business considerably with the Young Bucks and subsequently the Bullet Club Elite at the forefront of the promotion. Every town was up. The buzz could not be ignored and it was crystallized at Supercard of Honor 2018 at which the promotion drew its biggest ever house for a solo promoted show. 6,100 fans packed into the Uno Lakefront Arena to watch the Elite implode. They also watched on as delirious sh the bed. The show was senselessly, punishingly long to its fateful detriment. The wider wrestling content sphere was already reaching an event horizon. There was simply too much of it. Surely the play was to broadcast the best possible show in order to capitalize on the buzz, but to provide the fans with an incentive to return and watch the next round of narrative developments unfold. Number 8. Bully Ray the very reputable Fightful, no crap, just sap, reported in April 2019 that Delirious had lost control of the booking pencil and Bully Ray and Joey Mercury grew in influence as a sort of shadowy committee had formed. The first show on which signs of this were evident was the Ring of Honor New Japan G1 Supercard. Bully Ray lost his mind on the very first night of the job, basically. Ring of Honor's input into the G1 Supercard was a total disaster. While Bully might have just booked himself to lose, the street fight was an overlong, artless mess. Another overlong match held for the ROH world title, a ladder bout in which very little climbing or attempts to win happened, saw Matt Taven get the nod over the vastly more popular Marty Skrull, who had chased for ages after losing the previous year. The whole thing was just so bizarre, not that it scans as any great shame at all post-2020, but Ring of Honor was desperate to not strap Marty up fail to do it twice, and then give WWE main roster money and the book. These brain geniuses make Vince Russo look competent. Number 7. Vince McMahon Guys, fads end. That is the long and short of it, and the WWF was a fad. The Ultimate Warrior was a fad unto himself, and when Vince put two fads together, business shoved that control into a nosedive after taking the two pilots that have already made the sacrifice, or whatever incoherent bollocks that Warrior said, when promoting the Ultimate Challenge. The Ultimate Challenge itself was a cracking over-delivery for that era. However, at a time when pay-per-view was entering more and more homes, WrestleMania 6 drew an eye-watering 207,000 fewer buys WrestleMania 5. 
Was the unusual all-babyface dynamic just not as hot as a classic goody versus baddie showdown? Was wrestling on the downturn regardless? Or was the general public more interested in wrestlers who didn't throw weak clotheslines with their goddamn armpits? In any event, this was the first occasion on which Vince's ingrained impulses pushed muscle dickheads irrespective of their ability, found him out. Number 6. Vince McMahon AGAIN Vince McMahon actually evolved from pop culture powerhouse to deft pro wrestling booker in the early 90s. He lost the ability to reach the casual fan when they actually existed and instead set about telling fabulous, twisting long-term stories, the very best of which unfolded across the first quarter of 1994 as Bret Hart and brother Owen told a beautifully nuanced and emotionally intense tale of familial conflict. Regardless, 1995 was piss poor, 96 an improvement, 97 allowed fans a longer look at the shift towards a more compelling, edgy product, 98 saw Vince McMahon re-enter the American home with his piss-funny freak show, and 99 was too over to be perceived as the crap it was. 2000 was the zenith of quality and popularity intersecting, and at WrestleMania X7, Vince buggered up everything by pulling off the most Vince Russo swerve of the lot. He shook hands with Austin as Rock departed for Hollywood, killed two megastar babyfaces with one stone, had Kane headline the next pay-per-view, and continued to use Vince Russo's format for the next 21 years of tedious domination. On the subject of which, number five, Vince Russo. Be honest, did Vince Russo even have a mind to lose? The most ancient take you'll ever read on the wrestling internet is that Vince Russo required the filter of Vince McMahon to be effective in the role. You read this all the time because it's true, and for evidence of that, look no further than Vince Russo's very first night on the job in WCW. The man who, in league with Eric Bischoff, constantly contaminates wrestling discourse by saying that wrestling spends too much time catered to the marks by reimagining WCW as a meta show written by, yep, you guessed it, Vince Russo, who instantly became the most important character. Within an hour, Vince told the audience in a business predicated on suspension of disbelief that it was fake. Also, things that were meant to be real also happened, but he just bloody told you that they couldn't be. Some contrarian voices might tell you that NWO Silver had potential and that a series of unfortunate incidents scuppered the deal. But it was hardly going to salvage business, was it? Number four, Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff. Night one. On night one, the new regime of Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff shiz it the biz ed. On night one of the second Monday Night War, the ostensible relaunch of the promotion, they couldn't have done more to depict themselves as arrogant past it lunatics. Bischoff has subsequently claimed that he didn't believe for a second that TNA could compete and that the whole deal was a publicity stunt of sorts designed to put TNA on the map and transform profile and visibility into viewership when it went back to its own night. I'm not sure how our product is crap, so just change the day you watch it works in any sense, but perhaps there's some nuance that only big shots can grasp. The whole thing was a dire audience hemorrhaging farce. There was no Lex Luger on Nitro moment, but there was Jeff Hardy arriving and, to very little fanfare, handing out self-portraits to, like, two fans. There were no fans glued to the screen, wondering who might join the NWO next, but Homicide did get stuck in a cage... And there were no stars, so Hulk and Eric had to rely on the Nasty Boys. Actually, there were, but they weren't friendly enough with management, you know. Number three, Paul Heyman. ECW peaked before its first pay-per-view from a creative standpoint. The Sandman feigning blindness, the dated but fascinating at the time Raven vs. Tommy Dreamer storyline, Mick Foley's vastly influential anti-hardcore interloper shtick. These were mid-90s masterpieces penned at the peak of Heyman's powers. However, the descent into deep waters, helped by McMahon and Bischoff, forcing Heyman's head into the tides, didn't really become untenable until ECW debuted on TNN. The product was bereft of both stars and ideas, and Heyman, sensing that TV had arrived at least two years too late, petulantly threw in the towel by debuting an ostensible clip show. This was a bizarre political move, the move of a man who had perhaps lost the heart for the fight as opposed to his mind. Number two, Ghetto. 
The Omens were rumbling in 2019. Despite a G1 Climax tournament so awesome, productive and stirring that it was felt Ghetto had done it yet again, he had lost a top star in Kenny Omega and still weaved his booking magic. The decision to no-sell the G1 to expand Wrestle Kingdom 14 to two nights was perplexing, to be very generous but it was almost a waste of time in retrospect. Any copium-laced notion that it was some teething struggle natural to a new experiment was obliterated by 2021, when Kota Ibushi lost the G1 briefcase to Jay White, but was suddenly allowed to challenge for the IWGP heavyweight title, regardless across January 4th and 5th. Sadly, by this point, such nonsensical booking had become... Par for the course. The creeping notion that everybody had already worked together countless times just wouldn't go away. And while Ibushi, Osprey, and Shingo Takagi stepped up, Ghetto's staggered trilogy formula just felt worn. Strapping up evil as the double champ at Dominion 2020 underscored everything. Perhaps sensing that much had grown stale, the technically sound if bland charisma vacuum evil was pushed as the top heel of a promotion in which booing had been outlawed. New Japan, already devoid of ideas, had become inexplicable. Number one, Gabe Sapolsky. He was incredible in his prime. He transformed the wrestling landscape under the foot of the Monopoly, who very reluctantly incorporated the talent he helped build. The problem, and let's put this precise moment somewhere near the 10,000th day of Nigel McGuinness's great, if very overlong, title reign, is that Gabe thought the solution to the issue was more issues. Business declined between 2007 and 2008 because his penchant for strong style strike battles and near fall excess became tiresome to the point of parody. It is almost no wonder that he linked up with NXT subsequently. And that's our list. Did we miss any out? Let us know in the comment section below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And subscribe to What Culture Wrestling, wherever you get your podcasts from, for daily wrestling podcasts. Plus, you can let us know your thoughts on Twitter at What Culture WWE. And you can find me on there at Adam Wilborn. Thanks for watching. I've been Adam from What Culture, and I'll see you soon.